Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. I would like to start with a thought experiment. Imagine Elon Musk's Mars mission is successful, and humans start to colonize Mars. What would they eat? What would that food concept look like? It will probably have to be self-sufficient. It cannot rely indefinitely on the Earth. There is very little sunlight, so it has to have some form of artificial lighting to power the growth of the plants. There is a little bit of water locked up in ice, but not too much of it, so we have to use it wisely, probably in a very circular manner. The whole thing has to be in an enclosed protected structure to protect it from the elements. So it has to be really space efficient. So if farming on Earth is very closely tied to the nature and land around it, farming on Mars will have to be completely decoupled from it. If you put all of that together, it will start to look a lot like controlled environment agriculture or indoor farming. What's being done currently on Earth, albeit on a small scale, but it is done. So why is this important? Why is the Mars thought experiment important? Because what could possibly work on Mars could be hugely beneficial on Earth today. We don't need to wait for the Mars scenario. We need this kind of farming today, here. And here's why. The realities surrounding our food systems are inescapable. As these headlines show us, the food systems are being battered on three fronts. Climate change, lots of other speakers spoke to that today. The COVID pandemic, and the war in Ukraine. We've seen the worst European drought in 500 years now. We have seen the worst supply chain issues in 50 years due to the pandemic, and we continue to see those supply chain issues. And we have seen a devastating rise in the price of food. The FAO food price index has had a staggering 50% rise in the last year and a half alone due to, food, to, due to the crisis in Ukraine. All of that with devastating impacts on global hunger and food security. So our food systems are not resilient. They are prone to shocks from public health crises and wars and climate. And we are paying a high price for them. Food can be argued to be responsible as the biggest contributors to the breach of our planetary boundaries, our safe operating zone. If you look at biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus, these are being breached mostly because of fertilizer use and runoff. If you look at climate change, a third of global greenhouse gas emissions are tied to the broader agricultural system. If you look at biodiversity, 50% of the habitable area is dedicated to agriculture and is no longer a functioning part of the ecosystem that's supposed to bring ecosystem services to sustain life on Earth. So we can all agree the way we have produced and transported food is not fabulous. Not only it's problematic, it's just not enough. In the next four decades, we'll have to produce much more food than we have produced in the last 8,000 years. And that's for an increasingly urban population. One key piece in the puzzle that's emerging is the role of controlled environment agriculture, or indoor farming, and vertical farming as a component of that. We have seen a lot of success in the last three decades from the controlled environment agriculture, or indoor farming, really scaling. So we have seen in Spain, for example, 
44,000 acres have been dedicated to um, controlled environment agriculture, making Spain the food basket of Europe. And there are other examples. But of course, vertical farming, as part of that controlled environment agriculture, needs to grow and scale if it needs to become a serious and meaningful part of the, the food system and the food picture. What is vertical farming? Vertical farming is growing food independently of soil, in a highly controlled environment, in vertically stacked layers. For those of you who may not in-farm, let me briefly introduce you to in-farm. We are a Berlin scale-up. We were born in 2013. Currently, we operate in about 10 countries, including the UK. Just a couple of months ago, we opened one of our largest farms just outside of London in Bedford. And we produce millions of plants every month, and we're growing. Our product portfolio currently includes herbs, leafy greens, and salads. Uh, very soon, also strawberries, tomatoes, and mushrooms. And there are other crops that are on the horizon. Vertical farming is not an output of gradual change in traditional farming. It's a completely new and different way of farming. These are the features that, when combined, sets it completely apart from traditional farming and makes it a really promising source of producing and distributing food in a more sustainable way. First, food production doesn't translate directly into nature degradation. It's a farming model that decouples food production from harming nature because it doesn't need all the land, it doesn't harm the biodiversity, it doesn't degrade soil, it doesn't contaminate soil with agrochemicals. It is highly resource efficient. It needs, on average, 95% less land, 95% less water, 90% less food miles, and no agrochemicals, or no chemical ones, no chemical pesticides. Third, is climate resilient. So it's producing food indoor in a controlled environment. So it's independent of favorable climate conditions outdoor. It means it can produce a variety of food all year round with a flexible and predictable output. And finally, and this is probably the most important feature of vertical farming, it is urban. It is producing food inside the urban environments for the urban consumer where it needs to be marketed. By 2050, something around 70% of the global population will live in the cities up from just 50% today. So it's really important that we have a viable way of feeding the urban consumer with food that's fresh, that's accessible, that's high quality. And think of the implications for food self-sufficiency in the cities. Think about overall resilience in the cities that we sorely need in the face of climate shocks, geopolitical shocks, and other shocks that we have seen to the system. So it has a lot of promise and a lot of potential. But as we know, there are no silver bullets to the problems that we are facing today. Vertical farming and the sector in general come with a number of challenges that when addressed, those barriers become further opportunities and further benefits themselves. First, scale and reach. Vertical farming within the broader controlled environment agriculture is fairly small. It has tremendous potential, but it needs to grow if it wants to be serious in tackling the food system challenges. Also, vertical farming has been criticized as focusing mainly on the developed world. And it is true that the technological developments have happened mostly in the developed world, but two points to explore here. One is 
The technology is increasingly modular, so it's easily possible to adapt and adopt that technology for the emerging markets, such as we have seen with the successful example of India, adopting vertical farming at scale in the last few years. And the second point is that we need resilience and urban sustainable food systems and food self-sufficiency everywhere, not just the developed world. So what needs to happen within the uh, controlled environment, agriculture, and vertical farming is for it to grow, especially to prioritize areas where they would benefit most from, uh, from food self-sufficiency, areas that have harsher climates, less arable land, less water, high food imports. And this is exactly what we are doing. In farm is prioritizing its growth in areas that would benefit most from it. We have uh, just partnered this year with the Qatar Investment Authority, and we are building facilities in the Middle East, starting with a facility in Qatar in 2024. Second big issue is the climate footprint. With all the sustainability benefits that vertical farming brings, it has a carbon challenge and an energy intensity challenge because of its high reliance on electricity to power the growth of the plant, its climate control systems and use of refrigerants, not to mention the technology that comes, the infrastructure, and so on and so on. But I would argue that the carbon challenge is just a temporary one and not one that is fundamental barrier to the industry becoming a really sustainable source of food. Greg Jackson talked about this, as well as Richard Hubbard. We could utilize better technology, better material, renewable sources of energy, shorter supply chain, efficiency, to bring down the carbon problem to something that can put us on a pathway to net zero. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. Finally, also really importantly, impacting calories. Vertical farming has been criticized to focus primarily on leafy greens, salads, herbs, tomatoes, and that's not what the world feeds on. So if you're serious about solving the world's food system challenges, we need to think about how to scale that in terms of calories. 40% of the calories that the world consumes come from only three staple crops, rice, wheat, and maize. So if vertical farming does not move towards the production of staple crops, it can have no serious chance of tackling that problem. And it's not a technical problem. In a lab, you can produce whatever you want, but it's not economically viable. Someone did an experiment, not in farm, but they did an experiment and they ended up producing wheat in a vertical farm that cost 300 euros per tiny loaf of bread. This is not what's gonna work. Vertical farming needs to move from the edges of the plate with salads and microgreens further towards the center of the plate with more calorie dense crops and finally be right in the center of the plate. Again, this is something we recognize and we're working on. We have done some successful trials with producing wheat in our research labs and we're hoping to commercialize it in under 10 years to be able to have a viable and economic source of staple crops produced in vertical farms within the decade. Going back to the carbon challenge, we in, in, at Infarm recognize this is a serious problem and we're tackling it head on. Yesterday, we became the first vertical farming company to submit its science-based targets. And today, it's the first time we are publicly announcing it in this venue. This is hard. This is ambitious. We don't have all the answers. We don't have most of the answers. But we know where we need to head. And we know if you want to be a serious force in sustainable food production, this is what needs to happen with the carbon problem. This is putting us firmly on the path to net zero with a serious ambition, investment, and research behind it. But we also know that we cannot do it alone. A lot needs to happen in the broader industry. Our sector needs to become more transparent. There needs to be much more pre-competitive collaboration. This is something that is already happening, which is a good sign. 
more research and technology development needs to happen to help this scale, to help vertical farming scale in a more sustainable way. Regulation needs to be more enabling than putting a stop to disruptive technology like ours. And most importantly, perhaps, the consumer. An earlier speaker talked about the power of choice and the power of the consumer. This is very much true in our food. So the next time you are in front of a supermarket shelf and you're making a choice about what to reach out to and take, think about that for a moment. An additional second that you think about your choice of food is going to make a massive difference in the impact of that food. And finally, I just want to extend an invitation. Next week at COP27 in Egypt, we are hosting, co-hosting the first ever food systems pavilion that's going to put the food system right and center in the climate discussions. And this has not happened before, and it needs to. So please join us virtually or in person, and let us have a conversation. Let us talk about how we can together transform the food systems for good and start telling a different food story. Thank you for listening.